Welcome everyone to chapter 7 on decision making and creativity. <clears throat> We're going to talk about today about the McShane textbook on chapter 7. Uh, we discussed decision making and creativity and for those alumni returning I've recently added uh, new decision making tools and added some new elements on creativity in the workplace. This includes specific elements of uh, speeches from and talks from Ted on Adam Grant and his personalized discussions of habits of original thinkers as well. So we'll start off this class to talk about uh, the book Stall Points, which identifies that 17% of organizations fail due to internal problems largely associated with bad decisions. Um, and so there's no simple formula for making smart decisions. I would be the first to admit that I've made terrible decisions in my life, uh, like eating a half a deep and delicious McCain's frozen cake the other day uh, alone in bed while it was dark, hoping my kids wouldn't find out. Anyways, um, I've always also made terrible decisions in my past life. Uh, frosted tips come to mind. Uh, or when my hairstylist suggested I do a Caesar style haircut when that was popular back in the day. Come to think of it, I made multiple questionable hair choices during my lifetime. And some of that of you that know me personally could probably drop a comment in the comment box around some of the choices that I did make in my past. And uh, I'll hate you for it, but they'll be funny. But we digress. Uh, no decision is perfect in business, but often doing nothing is worse and people forget that doing nothing is a decision in itself. I've worked in large organizations where committee reviews, uh, recommendations from management and asked teams to go back and do further research multiple times to postpone decisions and add months to that decision because they want to have that perfect information. The speed of business has really changed dramatically and it's so critical to make decisions and move on, but speed can be the killer to have perfect information and, and the perfect decision. The speed of business has changed so fast that we really need to make decisions quickly, but accurately. So this lecture today is really about how to improve the decision making process in your organization and do it as accurately as possible, but still trying to maintain some of that speed that's necessary to run the business. Then the second concept we'll talk about in today's chapter is really about the, the concepts of creativity. And there's been a lot of great research lately, which I want to highlight as well. So the chapter starts off with uh, the element of the rational choice paradigm, which talks a little bit about the subjective expected utility, which really is the concept that in business, we try to make decisions that represent the most value for an organization. But the reality is in real life is we tend to satisfy, which means that what we tend to do is choose decisions that are good enough and move on because we need to maintain the speed of the organization. And that's the reality. Yeah. So the rational choice decision-making process is comprised of six key steps, as McShane talks about, which is identifying the opportunity, choosing the best decision-making process, discover and developing the possible choices, selecting the choice with the highest value, implementing that choice, and then evaluating that choice. Good, I'm glad it's a six there. So, and then when it comes to that decision-making framework, also identifying problems and opportunities is really difficult as the textbook covers off. So make sure you pay particular attention to stakeholder framing problems, decisive leadership problems, solution-focused problems, perceptual defense, and mental models. And in the Prezi slides, I've added a few examples uh, I want you to look at. Uh, Dr. Mohan's perspective in terms of how mental models actually cause the failure of General Motors, for example, and uh, other man car manufacturers in terms of producing cars in the wrong way that people really didn't want because their mental models were actually incorrect. And so the textbook also talks about how to fix the problem or identify problems correctly. Uh, I guess the thing that I would say about the textbook, it doesn't really cover this well. But the most single most important thing you can do, um, as the research talks about, is really to cultivate a culture of what's called divine discon discontent within your team. Making your team feel comfortable that they can challenge you. From a personal perspective, it's reminding your staff that you aren't perfect, that you're fallible, you're human, 
and you don't often have all the information at your fingertips to make the best decision possible. The challenge is that sometimes some of our employees expect us to be perfect. You know, we're in a leadership position and sometimes they have this high expectation that you should be making the decision. But the rules have really reversed now in today's job market and the business environment because more and more employees have access to information and they really understand what's going on the ground and it's harness, how to harness that information to apply it in the best decision possible. And that's the balance. So I'll talk about some of the tools to help. So this is relatively new for the alumni because I didn't have this in the course lecture before. So we'll talk about, you know, for example, scenario planning, decision matrices, T charts, decision trees, multi-voting processes, Pareto analysis, cost-benefit analysis, conjoint analysis, SWOT analysis, and PEST analysis are some ways of doing this analysis in a different way and evaluating your decisions. And I'll put that in the Prezi slides for you guys so that you can reference that as returning alumni as well. So when we talk about McShane's perspective on the challenges of rational mind versus reality, the goals are clear, but in reality, they're pretty ambiguous. Um, we think that in rational uh, or OB theory, that decision makers can calculate all the alternatives, but in reality, we have really limited ability to process all the mountains, mountains of information that are with us. Decision makers evaluate all the alternatives simultaneously, but in reality, we evaluate things in sequence. Decision makers use absolute standards to evaluate alternatives, but in reality, we evaluate alternatives against implicit favorites. OB thinks that decision makers use factual information to choose alternatives, but in reality, we often use perceptually distorted information based on our emotions. And decision makers often choose the alternatives with the highest payoff, but in reality, we often choose the option that's easiest to understand and do quickly. And so it's really important to understand how what we think rationally happens in the workplace doesn't really happen because of reality. And our emotions also affect our decisions significantly. Emotions form our early preferences. They change, change the decision evaluation process in terms of how we think. Emotions serve as information when we evaluate alternatives. And what we need to try to do is remove these emotional states from our decision-making process as that typically affects our judgment very significantly. In the textbook, it really uh, briefly mentions uh, intuition and what's called system one thinking. What we've been talking about today is right now system two thinking. And system one thinking is really where uh, you use your intuition to make judgment calls. Intuition can work when you really have well-established experiences and practices on dealing with the same situation over and over again, programmed responses to speed up our response. But make sure that the context and the environment still remain the same. Uh, there's been many examples of organizations and managers making mistakes with their intuition because things have really changed around them and they just haven't noticed. And there's a really important theory around this is that if you're going to use intuition, make sure you balance it with a really effective feedback and input from others so that you make good decisions that way. So now that we've talked about decision-making creativity for a little bit, let's go over what this chapter also talks about in creativity in the workplace. So this chapter also talks about characteristics of creative people who have independent imagination, cognitive and practical intelligence, knowledge and experiences, and persistence. So what I'd like you to do is, when you're going through the textbook, make sure you look at these four elements to really understand those, those four qualities of create, creative employees in the workplace. Um, what the textbook doesn't uh, discuss, uh, in my opinion, is hiring the right people when it comes to creatives in the workplace. I personally like to apply a simple T-shape to create to hire creative people. And what this means is that if you look at the shape of a T, is that we typically hire people that are along this length, which means that we hire that 20-year 20 20 accountant. But the T-shape person means that you also look at hiring persons that have this wide breadth of experience. So in addition to being a 20-year accountant, they also had five years being a teacher, five years in advertising, five years working overseas. And so this forms the length of this top of the T. And so that's the kind of person you're trying to hire is this T-shaped uh, person. Um, by the way, this is not my idea. I pulled this um, work from David Kelly, who is the founder of IDEO um, based in California, which is a famous design company of which I love to follow. And he talked a lot about how to hire the most creative individuals by looking for that T-shape in recruitment. The challenge is that we're all trained to hire the uncreatives. 
Your managers and leaders want you to hire someone with 30 years of experience as an accountant. They've done nothing else in their life. They specialized as an accountant and the best accountant, accountant that life has ever seen, that the world has ever seen. The, the trouble is they're terrible creative accountants. They only know one thing. And in this age of creativity, this experience age or whatever you want to call this age, it's not enough. I can tell you one thing, being an accountant has taught me one thing. It's a highly creative skill in understanding how to report income and expense, expenses. Trust me, I am a CPA. I did that in 2011, 2012 now, I think, but not practicing mind you anymore, but I went through the whole experience and I realized it's a really high, high, highly creative ex, uh, profession. The trouble is leaders frown at you when you want to recruit someone who doesn't have 20, 30 years experience, but an accountant who has spent 10 years as an advertising manager, they look at that person as being less qualified. But the truth is, they're able to come forward with creative solutions to solve tomorrow's creative problems and take it from someone like David Kelly, who's really experienced in hiring creative individuals to understand this T-shaped person. So if you, want to, if you want a CFO that volunteers nothing but the monthly financial statements at leadership, hire that person with only 30 years of experience. But if you want to hire someone that actually looks at things differently, make sure to look for those T-shaped people. Um, the next element is uh, relatively new because it's come out since I've done the course lectures, which is uh, some work that and research that Adam Grant has done. I'll, uh, I'll throw in a YouTube video link below so you can watch his videos in a little bit more detail. But his research identifies that people are, are not creative. The ones who are just try uh, longer. They finish later and they doubt the idea, not themselves. So for example, like he, Adam talks a lot about being quick to start but slow to finish. You know, he argues that the first mover advantage is really a myth. It's often the fast followers that are key that really get it right. Creatives have a feeling of doubt and fear like the rest of us. They just manage it differently. They focus on the idea to doubt, but they do not have self-doubt. Instead of saying, I am crap, like we all do, they say, this idea is, a, this idea is crap. And so they don't focus on themselves to become creative. And if you feel doubt, don't let it go. Keep trying. And, and most of the creatives that we see that Adam argues in his research have a greater re regret of inaction. And so they have this motivation to constantly strive. And you can watch that uh, video link where he talks a little bit more detail on that. And you can, uh, one thing that Adam doesn't mention in the video, which I, I there's an article that he wrote, um, well, when was that? How many years ago? I, I'm trying to, I'll see if I can find it really quickly. I can't. No, it was on the, the Daily Show. But he talked about this concept called burstiness. Um, burstiness is the concept. It's like the way Adam describes it. It's like the best moments in an improv jazz. You know, I remember being in Chicago once and watching this kind of um, rap battle. And it was so much fun to just see how they would react to the audience. And improv jazz is something like that, where someone plays a note, someone else jumps in with the harmony, and pretty soon you have a collective sound that no one really planned before. It's like the, the jam for some of you that are musicians. Most groups never get to that point, but you know burstiness when you see it. Psychologists understand biz burstiness as a pattern of how rapidly we take turns in conversations and without interrupting each other, jump in and help. Studies have found the most innovative and productive teams were bursty. And I love that concept that Adam talks about. And the, and the kicker is to create this uh, atmosphere of burstiness within your team, you already know the answer. It's by creating psychological safety in your teams that you saw, as I mentioned in chapter eight. A concept that you've already heard about and a concept that you already understand how to implement within your teams. And the second, uh, what Adam talks about is to create task bubbles, which I really love this concept and the way he describes task bubbles, which is something that we do in brainstorming is really taking your team away from everything else, setting a boundary and just focusing on complete immersion on the task to get highly creative. And third, constantly inviting diversity in your team by recruiting people that don't look like you or act like you so that they can actually add more creativity and different perspectives and fourth, spending a substantial amount of time getting to know each other on a personal basis, building those relationships so that there's high levels of trust, which we've talked about many, many semester uh, weeks for many, many weeks around this concept. So 
Um, I'll talk about some, I think in the next section is really about some additional authors that might help you uh, to understand how to look at creativity and decision making. So I think uh, the concept of, uh, I think the one of the most important concepts is really think about you're not alone. And there's a lot of power engaging your team to help you to become especially creative. So um, like crowdsourcing is a good example. This is from Jeff Howe. He talked about some concepts of getting people involved to help you make decisions. Uh, what would Google do in this book here? We talk a lot about that research around what Google does is to get teams involved to solve problems. And I love Sir Recky's work on uh, the wisdom of crowds as well. This is James' work on that concept of how you get people involved. And I really love the concept of prediction markets, which is really, if you want to look at more detail around that, is that uh, people can be really smart when they're together working on a problem and because they can easily outsmart the person, the one person in the room that's smart. Another favorite book on the topic of decision-making is Predictably Irrational. I love this book from Dan O'Reilly. There's a little bit of a YouTube video summarizing some of the elements of this book. Fantastic book on terms of decision-making and creativity. And if you want to learn more about why we're always irrational and why we make bad decisions all the time, Dan is a fantastic fun read to, to go through as well. And then the other thing I also want to talk about is uh, uh, Steve Johnson's book, one of my favorites. You know, it's called "What, Where Good Ideas Come From, The Natural History of Innovation. I think the most important thing, if I can see it on my bookshelf, here it is, yeah, is that what Steve Stephen Johnson talks a lot about is the concept that when it comes to great ideas, it's actually a slow step to incubation. It's not this massive eureka moments, but small steps that build towards creativity. And he kind of debunks the myth that, you know, the really smart people are just really smart people trying really hard to understand a solution over the long term. So uh, if you want to understand that in the process and look for Stephen Johnson's book as well, it's a fantastic perspective. And then I've attached some YouTube links at the bottom for additional perspectives as well. And uh, if you want to look some, for something Canadian, I, I might suggest this book called Opposable Mind, uh, Roger Martin, uh, a Canadian who wrote uh, the concept of integrative thinking. And I love this book a lot too, because it talks a lot about how organizations can generate more integrative thinking within their leadership team and themselves. So these might be some books that you decide to throw on your bookshelf to think about how I plan and how you plan to build more creative organizations with who make better decisions. So hope you like this quick lecture to do the subscribe, like and comment, all that kind of stuff in the bottom. Thanks very much. It helps the channel out. And I'll see you guys in class very shortly. Thanks. Bye.